Hello again, everybody. Before I get started on the science, I realized that during my introduction, I neglected something that was actually very, very important. And that is to thank Chelsea Gank. I think you all know Chelsea. She was at the check-in table. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, exactly. Um, absolutely. Um, without her and Arita, who I think is still out there now, this day really wouldn't have come together. So Chelsea has been instrumental in making sure that all of us, the speakers, do our jobs. And then also, of course, in um, the registration and setting everything up and the food and the room and everything and this beautiful space that she found for us. So thank you very much to Chelsea and also thank you to the University of Delaware. Um, Dean Kathleen Matt has also been really instrumental in working with us in order to be able to bring this program up to you up here in Delaware. So thank you very much. So without further ado, we're moving into the science now. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. And the idea is to take Dr. Dawson's talk and then and what he was discussing in terms of what happens to the neurons in the brain and why they're not working correctly, and then move it a little bit closer to what else we're doing with his research. So that's sort of where this biomarkers is going. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be discussing the importance of biomarkers for Parkinson's disease, efforts that are underway to identify those markers, and then I'm going to be discussing some potential diagnostic and progression markers. So with that in mind, though, I think the first question is going to be, what is a biomarker? So a biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of an either normal biologic processes, pathogenic processes, meaning things that shouldn't be necessarily happening, or pharmacologic response, meaning drug response, to a therapeutic intervention. So this is the official definition of a biomarker. It came out I don't know, 10, 15 years ago in a specific paper, and this is the definition that we all use. So what does that actually mean? So a good biomarker should be able to diagnose disease, predict changes in disease, change with treatment, and be related to the underlying disease process. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples now that hopefully sort of clarify what we're talking about. So a good example is sugar levels for diabetes. So diabetes, very common disease. When you go to your doctor, he or she will check, amongst other things, your sugar or glucose level. If your sugar or glucose level is above a certain number, you have been diagnosed with diabetes. It is a diagnostic test. Similarly, if that number is really high and continues to stay really high, we can kind of predict how your diabetes is going to do over time and that we and you and we need to partner together to provide better management of that diabetes. So it can do some predicting of change. It also, very importantly, changes with treatment. So if someone is diagnosed with diabetes and they lose 10% of their body weight and they take their medication and they start exercising and they change their diet, then that, they're getting treated for their diabetes and their sugar levels will come down. And the next time the doctor tests their blood test, then all of a sudden their sugar levels are better. They were treated and we can see that response to treatment. And then it's also related to the underlying disease process. So without going into the details of diabetes and why diabetes develops, suffice to say that the sugar levels are related to that underlying process. So what we want is something like sugar levels for Parkinson's disease. So a few more non-Parkinson's disease examples of biomarkers. An elevated temperature can be indicative of a fever or an infection. That is a biomarker of a fever or infection. Blood pressure is a really good one as well, because we try to get your blood pressure under good control, because a high blood pressure increases your risk of things like strokes and heart attacks. So blood pressure is also a good biomarker. Um, we'll also get an MRI of your brain if we think you had a stroke. So that's also a biomarker, a test that will tell us a disease process. 
And then there's also things like genetic testing for Huntington's disease, and that will tell us and diagnose whether or not someone has Huntington's disease. So what we want is a biomarker for Parkinson's disease. So most of my patients come and they oftentimes will tell me a story of my first doctor said I had this, my second doctor said I had this, and now it's been two years of symptoms and no one can tell me what I have. Well, we would like to have ideally a blood test to be able to diagnose the disease. And then similarly, we would like to be able to tell you, again, ideally with a blood test, what things are going to be like in 5, 10, 15 years. Because when I speak to my patients, what most of them say is, look, if my current symptoms were exactly where they were and I wasn't going to change, I can deal with this. It's not ideal, I don't like it, but I'm okay. It's that change and the, and the changes over time that is, that is very worrisome, understandably and appropriately to patients. And so what can we do to be able to predict who, how people are gonna change over time and help at the very least in terms of decision making? So if we think that you're gonna be someone whose disease is gonna change rapidly, that may change what you decide to do in the next five years compared to someone whose disease is gonna go really slowly. But even better and even more importantly is we would love to have a drug to be able to stop the disease progression at all. And so biomarkers are one of the steps towards that process. So right now, how do we diagnose Parkinson's disease? So Dr. Martello uh, talked about this earlier, but you basically go into your doctor, he or she takes a history, they do an exam, sometimes they get that dopamine transporter scan or DOT scan that Dr. Martello spoke about, and basically we say, look, yes, you have Parkinson's disease. Based on our medical knowledge, your history and your exam, this is what you have. And so wouldn't it be great if there were a test or imaging study that could diagnose Parkinson's tell us about disease progression, or tell us which medications would work and who would get medication side effects. So I know um, for those of you for whom I I'm fortunate enough and have the privilege to care for, you know that sometimes I'll say things like, well, we're gonna start with this medication, but every patient reacts differently, and some folks do really well with it, and some folks do really bad, and some folks have side effects, and the only way we're gonna know is to try it. Wouldn't it be great if we had some way of, of doing a better job of predicting which is which. And we have some information and some guidance on that, but we'd love to do a better job. So biomarkers have three uses. They can be diagnostic markers, they can be progression markers, or what we call pharmacokinetics, or related to the drug markers. Diagnostic markers would identify patients with Parkinson's disease assist with patient selection for clinical studies. Because as Dr. Martello, Martello at one point spoke about, sometimes we're wrong, and so we would love to be able to identify with better confirmation who has Parkinson's disease really early in the disease. And then we also could direct drug regimen and treatment strategies based on that. For progression uh, markers, we want to monitor patients as they progress and measure, be able to measure modifications and how people do with different drug responses. And we also want to be able to monitor people's response to drugs. So basically biomarkers can do all of those things. So the idea is that biomarkers could improve all aspects of patient care by being diagnostic, progression, or pharmacokinetic markers. And we're really looking for all three. And it'd be great if we could have one biomarker for all three of those things, but in practice we may end up with a couple biomarkers or a few for each of them. So how does finding a biomarker work? What do we do to identify a biomarker? So we see patients and we assess their motor function. So you go to your doctor and he or she has you tap your hands really big, open and close, and we come up with a whole weighting scale based on that. So we assess your motor function. We oftentimes assess people's cognitive function, their thinking and their memory, and we do all sorts of memory tests. We also sometimes assess psychiatric function. We assess sense of smell. We basically assess all of those areas, or as many areas as we can that patients report having symptoms. And it usually involves lots of tests and lots of scales. And then we also get blood, sometimes spinal fluid, imaging, urine, DNA, all sorts of other things that are these more objective tests. Because the idea is that our examination is a little bit more subjective 
is really the idea. So as much as we're well trained and you know what you're doing too and we know what we're doing, there's still a subjectivity to it. Was we want something objective, we want a hard number. That's the idea. So we get the blood and the spinal fluid and the imaging and the urine and the DNA because there are more hard numbers associated with that. And then we try to connect the clinical changes or findings with this molecule or imaging that we have in the blood and the spinal fluid, et cetera. So we try to make the connection between those two. And that's how we find a biomarker. So if the molecule or imaging correlates with, connects with the clinical assessments, it is a potential biomarker. So if this molecule is really high in patients who have Parkinson's disease and really low in controls, then it's a potential diagnostic marker. If a molecule is really high in my patients with Parkinson's disease, who when I follow them over time get worse more rapidly, then really low in patients for whom I follow over time, they, go, they do really well and they progress really slowly, then maybe it's a progression marker. So that's the idea. You can have a diagnostic marker or a progression marker and you can follow patients over time. And now a number of different investigations are trying to do exactly this. Connect those clinical assessments with the molecules that we're working on and that Dr. Dawson was talking about in his uh, talk just a moment ago. So here's just a couple of them. And I'm, there's the BioFind study that we talk about here. Well, hold on, how do I have? So, oh. There's the BioFind study, the Parkinson's Disease Biomarker Program, or PDBP, the Udall Center, PPMI. So there's a number of these. There's a number more as well going on all over the country and all over the world, really, trying to find these biomarkers. But I put this slide up here as well to not just be able to talk about the different studies that are trying to do this, but also to emphasize that there's a whole process. So as much as I just said, we do the clinical assessments and we collect, connect them to the molecule, we actually have to do that multiple times before we say something is a biomarker. So first we have to discover it. Uh, hold on. First we have to discover it. So that's biomarker discovery. Then we have to verify that it's actually true. Then we have to optimize the assay, make sure that it's really working well. Then we have to validate it. Then we sort of qualify it. And then eventually, we can come to commercialization. And commercialization means that when you go to your doctor, you actually just get the test and have it done. But this process is rather long, because what happens is the first thing we do is need to discover it. And then what we're talking about, and what I'm going to talk about now, are the studies that the PDBP, the Parkinson's Disease Biomarker Program, and the Udall Center, those are really in the discovery and verification realm. And then down the line, we then can apply it and validate it in other cohorts, in other groups of people. So what we're talking about is kind of early on right now. We're talking about the PDBP and the Udall Center today and some of the things that we've been finding at Hopkins based on those cohorts and that, those groups of people. But it doesn't, just because we found it at Hopkins doesn't mean it's necessarily true at Delaware. Doesn't mean it's necessarily true anywhere else in the world. And so one of the interesting things is we have to make sure that whatever we test in Dr. Dawson's lab at Hopkins is actually also true at the lab up at Harvard and also true with a completely different group of patients. So it is a slow process because we have to make sure that we're not just looking at what we have here at Hopkins. And we don't think we are. We think it's true. We have some pretty good data that I'll show you. But nevertheless, that's part of the process is we have to make sure that this is going to really work for all patients. So the Parkinson's Disease Biomarker Program, or PDBP, is a National Institutes of Health initiative. So this is basically your tax dollars at work, is what this is. So the PDBP is a large group of folks. It's about 1,840 patients. So it's 1,840 patients nationwide at a number of different sites. So certainly not 1,840 people at Hopkins. Um, what they're showing you here on the blue and orange picture is that most of those people are cases. So that means most of them 
are not controls. Controls are healthy people who don't have any other disease process. And then you can see the um, about 60% of the, that 1840 are cases. Amongst the people who are cases, the red are people with Parkinson's disease, and then the green, the purple, the orange are people with these other diseases here. So things like corticobasal syndrome, essential tremor, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy. Those other diseases, the diseases that aren't in red, the MSI, the multiple system atrophy, the progressive supranuclear palsy, those are what we call Parkinson's plus syndrome. So those are cousins of Parkinson's disease is what those are. But most of the 1840 are either individuals with Parkinson's disease or controls. And then what this is showing is there's a lot of biospecimens and biofluids available from these 1840 people. So you can see there's blood, there is blood, there's spinal, CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, there's DNA, there's plasma, which is a part of blood, there's RNA, there's serum, another part of blood, a whole bunch of urine too. Um, and I put this up here not to memorize numbers, but rather to point out that there's you know, more than 1,000 samples available in some of these cases, more than 600 samples available in some of these cases, and we follow these people over time. And what's really exciting about this in terms of you know, your tax dollars at work is these uh, the clinical data from these patients and all of these samples that are available here can actually be utilized by researchers all over the country and potentially all over the world. So what it means is that people with great ideas all over the place can apply in order to be able to use these biofluids in order to find biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. So it's actually a really great initiative that they're working on. So this is now the Hopkins site of the Parkinson's disease biomarker program. So of that 1,840 people, we have a total of, I believe, 121 people. So we have 121 of the 1840, and our 121 people have all given blood and spinal fluid. So we have 86 people with Parkinson's disease and 35 controls. And I just put this up here really more for showing you that these are just an example of some of the assessments and things that we write down about all of our patients, how old they are, their education, their gender, their race, um, their motor scores, how, so what their motor testing is, what medication they're on, the total levodopa dosing, um, anxiety and depression scales, cognitive scales, um, so these are just an example of some of the things. In order to then be able to take all this data and correlate it with these molecules that I'm going to be talking about over the next couple of slides. And so then this is within the, the Udall Center, is the other cohort that we're working with. Within the Udall Center, we have 105 people, all of whom have donated blood, some of whom have donated spinal fluid. And so again, this is just a nice example of age, gender, race, education, all of these things that we're sort of keeping track of. And in the Udall Center, we also have some folks with that atypical Parkinson's disease, those Parkinson's disease cousins. And the reason those people are important is because oftentimes, when movement disorder docs are wrong about diagnosis, we're wrong because it turns out the patient doesn't have Parkinson's disease, they actually have one of these atypical diseases, these Parkinson's cousins. So it's nice to get the biofluids from these atypical people, and that way, the atypical Parkinson's people, I should say, um, that way we can make sure that our biomarker, our molecule, is specific to Parkinson's disease and not specific to somebody who has those other diseases, because we want to diagnose PD. So I know you've already heard this today, but again, we feel that repetition is good. Circling back just a touch for two slides about the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So the loss of these dopamine-producing cells right there is thought to be responsible for the motor changes observed in Parkinson's disease. And again, alpha-synuclein is considered the bad protein, for lack of a better terminology here. And this is a nice, pretty example of what alpha-synuclein looks like. And the alpha-synuclein is, is in these things called Lewy bodies, which is up here, that dark area up there is the Lewy body. And down here is that, that pretty circle there, that pink circle, that like light pink circle within the dark area, that's the Lewy body. Um, and so that's where the bad protein, the bad alpha-synuclein is. So 
how do we get the bad alpha synuclein and cell loss? And the best analogy I could come up with that I use in my clinic is that there is a protein cascade. So one bad protein, one activated protein, or one activated molecule, then triggers another activated molecule, which triggers another, 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 and downstream events, and that eventually ultimately leads to the dysfunction or death of the cell. So how, what I would like to do now is play the video on the, on the left there that says when these, do, when these dominoes fall, that leads to cell death. That's the idea. How do I, so how do I get the video going? How did you do that? AV guy here. Ah, is the AV guy here? Oh, perfect, yes. So basically you can see here, and the idea is that the dominoes fall, and when those dominoes fall, that leads to cell death. And each domino along the way is a potential marker of the disease, a potential biomarker. So each domino along the way. Now, just to as sort of foreshadow where we really want to go with all this, if we play the video, that other, other video, thank you. And go for it. Oh, you don't need my, my encouraging my four year old to push the domino there. Um, so what you can see here is I basically took out a few of the dominoes, I blocked them, I stopped them. And by doing that, those dominoes at the end don't fall anymore. So in other words, there's no more cell death. I don't know where the music came from. Oh, thank you, okay. Um, so the idea is that the protein cascade is like a domino cascade. Each domino is a potential biomarker. And if we can stop the dominoes, if we can pull out some of that activation, if we can get rid of some of those molecules, then in the end, the hope is that that would not lead to cell death. So this is what it looks like in the dominoes in my house. And... This is what it may look like and what we think it looks like in your actual cells. So the idea is that you have this um, mitochondrial dysfunction and cellular stress that Dr. Dawson was talking about. That abnormal alpha synuclein, those little red lines should look familiar from the last talk. That goes through, it activates molecules, it activates in a couple of different directions. It goes down, it leads to more active things. It leads to something down here called PAR, or poly-ADP ribose. That's the sugar that Dr. Dawson was talking about. And then eventually down the line, it leads to cell death. So this is essentially just putting names on all of those different dominoes that I showed you a slide earlier. So these are just all of their different names because we, know we need to sort of label each of them. So going back, looking at the domino cascade a moment again, I mentioned already the poly ADP ribose. I also want to talk about, also want to discuss alpha synuclein is here. There's also something called Parkin here and Paris and AIMP2. So these are just some of the names. And the next couple of slides now, I'm actually going to go through some of the evidence that we have pointing out each of these or some of these different molecules as potential biomarkers. So the first one is PAR, or the poly-ADP ribose. And what this is showing is it separates, meaning it's different, between individuals with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease and controls at different study visits. So this is in the spinal fluid. So these are, these are patients who agree to come in and get a spinal tap or lumbar puncture and we collect their spinal fluid, we process it, and then this is the results of some of our testing. So what I'm showing you here is visit number one, visit number two, visit number three, and visit number four. The blue bars are the Parkinson's disease patients, and the kind of reddish bars are the healthy controls. And what you can see is that each visit, one, two, three, and four, the blue bars are higher than the red bars. So what that means in this context is that the concentration, the amount of PAR is higher in individuals with Parkinson's disease than it is with controls. So what this implies is that maybe if we could test PAR levels in folks with Parkinson's disease and they're high, that might mean that that's a way of diagnosing Parkinson's disease. Because PAR levels are higher in individuals with PD than in controls. Furthermore, and this is the exact same slide that Dr. Dawson just showed, 
is that the PAR levels may also relate to disease severity. So what we're showing here is disease duration in years. So people have had the disease for 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And then this over here is the Honan yaw That's just a motor score. So what we're saying here that the longer people have had the disease, things kind of get worse over time. So you guys tell me that. I don't, you don't need me to tell you that. But the part that's really interesting here is down here. What this is showing is that disease duration over time, 10, 20, 30 years, and PAR levels. And so here we can see that individuals who've had the Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease for longer, their levels of PAR were a little bit higher. So that red line there in the middle is kind of the idea. In other words, your PAR levels are going up over time. So maybe PAR is also a marker of progression because it's changing over time. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about different forms of alpha-synuclein. And so we talked about the alpha-synuclein already as the bad protein. It's one of those dominoes, and it's a really important domino. And what we think is that some forms of alpha-synuclein are more toxic, more bad than other forms. They're all, none of them are great, but some are worse than others. So what I'm going to go through here is that there are different forms of alpha-synuclein. And it, if you look at this, this is something up here called a Western lot. You don't need to remember that. But rather, if you look at kind of the dark lines on these four healthy control people, one, two, and three, and four, and then you look at the dark lines on the Parkinson's the people, disease folks, one, two, three, four, and five, I would argue that the dark lines look different on numbers one through four than they do on the, on the Parkinson's one to five. So the, the, what that means is those, those proteins are a little bit different. That's what that means. So it's all alpha-synuclein, but the alpha-synuclein protein is different in controls than it is in Parkinson's disease. So now if we take that data and we take those same patients and we look at this right here, again, healthy controls, one, two, three, and four, Parkinson's disease patients, one, two, three, four, and five. And now what we're doing is we're putting that bad alpha-synuclein, that toxic alpha-synuclein, on a petri dish with some neurons, and then we're waiting a few weeks and we're seeing what happens. And what you can see here is in the healthy controls, so in healthy control number one, the alpha-synuclein didn't do a thing. After two weeks, 100% of those neurons are, sort of, are still alive. So the, the alpha-synuclein for that patient didn't touch those neurons. But the alpha-synuclein on healthy control 2, 3, and 4, you can see about 50% of the neurons did indeed die. Um, and so, that, but that's, and that's kind of what happens in these healthy control people. Where it gets more interesting, I think, is that if you look at these Parkinson's disease patients, you can see that Parkinson's disease patient 1 and number 4, only about 20% of their neurons are still alive, 20% um, of the neurons on the Petri dish are still alive after two weeks of having that, those patients alpha-synuclein on them. So in other words, that's really toxic, alpha-synuclein. That alpha-synuclein is really destroying those neurons. But you can see in Parkinson's disease patient two and three, you can see that actually their amount of neurons still alive is actually the same as the healthy controls. In other words, that alpha-synuclein isn't that toxic. And where it gets really intriguing is if you look at these people's cognition, their change over time, for my, those two patients for whom the, the alpha-synuclein was not that toxic, those were the two patients of the five in the study that um, continued to have normal cognition five years, into the, five years into my following them. Not five years into the disease, but five years into my following them. And so what we're saying is that maybe the toxicity of the alpha-synuclein, how bad the alpha-synuclein is, may be an actual biomarker. And I'm not going to go into this in de detail, but suffice to say, what we're looking at here is actually a bunch of different molecules in the blood. 
And so the other two things I showed you were all molecules of the cerebrospinal fluid. These are actually some molecules in the blood. So these are some of the dominoes that I showed you before in the blood. And what we're basically seeing here, the orange is consistently higher than the white because these numbers, these, these specific molecules are consistently higher in people with Parkinson's disease than controls. And so each of them may be a potential biomarker. So the question is, have we find, found a biomarker? And the answer is maybe. So our next steps are going to be looking at whether each molecule is still a biomarker in other cohorts, in other groups of patients. We also need to determine if the marker changes with some of these newer treatments that are coming down the line. And then we also want to test each biomarker to see if it's specific to Parkinson's disease versus some of those other diseases I talked about. So thank you very much, and I think we have time for like one question. I saw you first. Yes, ma'am. I noticed in your chart when you identified the uh, attributes of your participants in your studies, it was predominantly males, white males. Any reason for that? And the reason is? That is a fabulous question. So I have a couple of thoughts on that. And I would, yes, that is a great question. So two things. Um, if you go back to some of the numbers, it is predominantly male. Parkinson's disease is about 60% men. So it's not unusual to have more men than women. So that in and of itself, the, our numbers of men more or less, at least on the Parkinson's side, not the controls, but on the Parkinson's side, our numbers of men actually more or less reflect the underlying disease. So for that part, we're doing okay. Um, I agree completely with you over the concern that it is primarily white men and women. Um, and that goes to a host of issues and concerns with recruitment of persons of color and underrepresented minorities in research. Um, and I would um, welcome any and all ideas to try to diversify our research. And this is a problem across the board in pretty much most Parkinson's studies that I know of. And it's a huge problem, actually, and that we are really looking at what happens in people who are willing to come in and do lumbar punctures and have access to care issues and all of the things that go into the social determinants of health and that go into um, our uh, efforts to try to recruit minorities for research participation. So I actually welcome any and all ideas on how to in improve that, and I agree completely. Oh, and actually now I'm gonna, um, I am, my job to introduce Dr. Kelly Mills, who is the director of our Movement Disorder Center.